This episode is brought to you by ForestBars.com, natural supplements for human enhancement. Forest produces full-spectrum, bioactive, mushroom-infused chocolate with powerful benefits, sustainably sourced and served. Receive 10% off your first order with code 0HOUR10. Welcome to the Psychedelics Anonymous Zero Hour Webinar. Today, we will be chatting with Professor Robin Carhart Harris. He is a psychologist and neuroscientist and head of the Center for Psychedelic Research, Division of Brain Sciences, Faculty of Medicine at Imperial College London. He coordinated the first clinical study of psilocybin in the UK and the first clinical study of a classic psych psychedelic drug in the UK for over 40 years. After being awarded an MA in psychoanalysis at Brunel University, London, Carhart Harris completed his PhD in psychopharmacology at the University of Bristol. In 2009, under the mentorship of Professor David Nutt, he relocated to Imperial College London to continue his functional MRI research with the classic psychedelic psilocybin a distinguished professor of neurology and psychiatry at UCSF in California. And Robin has authored over 130 papers with over 14,000 citations. With that, we welcome you, Dr. Carhart Harris. Thank you, Burton, good to be with you. I really need to give you an updated bio, <laughs> sorry about that. But uh, no, that, that was fab, thank you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, looking forward to uh, the banter and the conversation today. I thought it would be cool to kick things off by asking you what initially sparked your interest in researching the effects of psychedelics on the brain. How did you get into this field? Yeah, in a sense, like, how can you <laughs> how can you not be interested <laughs> in something like that? I guess you know, uh, rewinding. Um, I was a curious teenager. I'd had some experiences, and and that sparked a, an interest. Um, and then I was drawn to psychology very much, and I'd, uh, I studied that for in the UK. We call it our A levels. I'm not sure what the US uh, equivalent is, um, but uh, I absolutely loved that and devoured everything I could read. I got into depth psychology, reading Freud in particular, who kind of blew my mind, was my first kind of intellectual sort of uh, inspiration um, and, and went on for years into my 30s, I'm in my early 40s now, but you know, reading Freud uh, and uh, yeah, getting getting a lot from it. I went on actually after doing a degree in psychology and then a master's, the master's in psychoanalysis. So I, I went on to have my own analysis, which is very interesting. And so that's psychoanalysis and that particular perspective on the human mind that, you know, basic tenet, tenets being that there's an unconscious mind that uh, isn't uh, easily visible to conscious awareness, but can come up under certain conditions. Uh, and so sort of seeing that basic tenet that is, so profound if true yet seems to exist outside of mainstream you know taught psychology is sort of seen somewhat as a belief system or even regarded by you know many sort of authority figures in mainstream psychology as, as wrong as like having been proven wrong which isn't the case um and so uh you know i thought very much that there was something there with uh, psychoanalysis and it was during studying psychoanalysis that I uh, discovered um, psychedelics in the academic sense. And I found literature and specifically Stan Groff's, uh, one of Stan Groff's books, uh, a classic one, Realms of the Human Unconscious. I found that and that that was a, a real pivotal moment for me was uh, finding that book. And, you know, the lights very much came on. Ah, that that was it <laughs> that's it wow you know it was it's kind of curious in a way because early experiences that i had and then i find myself studying depth psychology not thinking about psychedelics really at least not consciously there's an irony there 
Uh, and then I find this book and it's just like, that makes sense. You know, that's what happens under psychedelics. And then, and then it was like, well, that this really matters because maybe with psychedelics, as Stan Groff was saying in his book, we can um, acquire sort of laboratory evidence for the existence of the unconscious. And, and, you know, if we develop that kind of evidence, what kind of impact is that going to have on psychology more generally? And, uh, you know, twinning psychology with human neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience, what, uh, what can we learn about brain correlates of these mind phenomenon? You know, the flip side of the mind phenomenon, the brain phenomenon and body phenomena. <laughs> phenomena. Um, so that was the that was the hook, yeah, you know, sort of different sort of pivotal moments. But that one coming when studying for that master's in 20s or early 2000s. And then, you know, I knew I wanted to make that my career in a sense, uh, I can say that. And so I wanted to do a PhD and then I pursued an opportunity to do a PhD on, on psychedelics and, and specifically psychedelic imaging. And I put a proposal to David Nutt that you mentioned in the intro there that we could, in a sense, image the unconscious becoming conscious under LSD. That was my proposal. Using fMRI, we could see that transition of unconscious material emerging into conscious awareness and and so it was very sort of uh grandiose and lofty and you could say vague and unrealistic but david uh um heard me and um gave me an opportunity to do a phd i did it on, on a slightly different topic something a little bit more tangible um but it was my foot in the door it was actually looking at sleep architecture with doing sleep recordings, EEG recordings, but doing it in people that uh, were MDMA users, had used a relatively large amount of MDMA versus match control. So people who hadn't used MDMA, but were otherwise matched for, you know, important confounding variables or factors like age and, you know, sex and so on, uh, alcohol use and so on. So, yeah, so I was using... Um, Sleep is an index of the health of the brain, of the serotonin system more specifically. And actually within the study, we manipulated the serotonin system with a dietary method and then recorded sleep to see, in a sense, how healthy uh, the serotonin system was as indexed by sleep and with that challenge on board. And the short story is that, uh, if I could do short stories, is that... Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, there was no difference between the MDMA users and the match controls in terms of their sleep architecture. So it looked as though they hadn't damaged their serotonin systems as indexed through sleep and the serotonin challenge. But anyway, that was my my foot in the door, my PhD in, in basic psychopharmacology. Then, in a sense, the rest is history because that gave me a platform. It certainly wasn't easy at all. It really wasn't trivial to get actual psychedelic drug administration going in the uk we were the first to do that in this modern era um in the uk and uh but that was hard i would say david was critical in enabling that you know being present at ethic uh the ethics review meeting for a psilocybin fmri study he was there with me uh let's see now around about 2008 2009 yeah, and that that was the that was the first sort of bit of momentum in terms of becoming a psychedelic researcher, I suppose. Brilliant. Now, for those that are tuning in from the audience or listening to this recording who do not carry a PhD, I think it would be great if you could speak a little bit about what's going on in the brain when exposed to a psychedelic. Uh, perhaps invoking your research, explaining what is the default mode network and what's going on? Well, uh, we can address this in stages or levels because um, that's quite relevant. Uh, obviously, it begins with taking in a drug, whether ingesting or some other mode of administration. So the molecule, the drug's got to get into the body and get into the bloodstream and then get into the brain. And once in the brain, 
the molecule, the psychedelic molecule, uh, is going to dock, it's going to bind to, it's going to have affinity for or stickiness for a certain, well, it has affinity for a few different, we call them receptors, which are proteins, signaling proteins um, that are, have evolved for what we call neurotransmitters or um, signaling uh, brain chemicals. Um, and there's one in particular that seems to be key to the action of psychedelics. And it's a kind of, it's a real staple, I would say, in terms of the science of the action of classic psychedelics. By classics, I mean compounds like LSD, psilocybin, DMT, mescaline. Um, it's the serotonin 2A receptor and heavily expressed in, in the cortex, the outermost aspect of the brain and the aspect of the brain that humans have so much of. Uh, way more than our nearest evolutionary neighbors. Certain regions of the cortex are expanded tenfold in our species relative to, um, say, chimps or macaque monkeys. And uh, actually, you get a lot of 2A receptors in these heavily expanded regions. We've got a new paper coming out on this. Watch out for that. It's going to come out in Brain, a classic neurology journal, um, on a potential role for serotonin 2A receptor signaling in the expansion of the human brain, um, which is quite, it was quite fun to write and was very much a team science project, bringing in uh, different scientists with different skill sets, rodent researchers and preclinical researchers, and then, the, you know, us being human researchers. Anyway, so the, there's a particular signaling protein, the 2A receptor, heavily expressed in the cortex and especially in high level cortex, also the visual system. When stimulated by the psychedelic molecule, it increases the sensitivity of the host neurons. It makes them hypersensitive, um, like a hypersensitive person, you know, in, in a sense, any environment. But if in a stimulating one, it's going to be overwhelming. And that's kind of what's happening at a single cell level. So the neurons become more sensitive to firing. And that's a key starting point is this uh, increase in signaling at the 2A receptor. There may be a certain, it's getting a little complicated here, but a certain, you know, all signaling at receptors and the 2A receptor is no exception, isn't uh, equal. Like there are different ways to stimulate a receptor. Um, but you maybe don't need to know that. But what you do need to know is that when you zoom up a level now, so instead of thinking of molecules binding to proteins on single neurons, brain cells, we're looking at aggregates of, of neurons, populations, thousands of neurons. And we look at their electrical potentials as they oscillate, more negative or positive. And... Uh, we can look at that rhythmicity and that activity. And there, I would say, we see a kind of gestalt, um, a whole, and a, maybe an emergent property that uh, is um, especially relevant, I think, to the action of, of psychedelics and how that action maps to changes in consciousness, which is that the, the activity of that population level becomes um, less regular. If you want this statistical regularities of oscillatory activity or rhythms goes down, the activity becomes dysregulated. Another way to say it, borrowing a term from physics, um, generally speaking, is, is entropy. The entropy goes up, which means that as we measure the signal across time, it becomes harder to predict. We're less certain when we sample it as to what we're going to find. It becomes more complex, more diverse, more entropic. I call that the entropic brain. The very reliable principle, you'll see it across species with these classic psychedelics. Um, it correlates with the intensity of the trip when you collect subjective ratings. And uh, it's also, we're seeing now, this, this effect is predictive of things, important things downstream, like changes in people's mental health presentation um even up to one month later we've seen in our data so this is important you've got the molecule coming in binding to the 2a receptor serotonin 2a receptor heavily expressed in cortex especially high level cortex and visual system the effect of that at the population level population of neurons is to make their activity less regular more entropic more um 
yeah, random in a sense. And then that maps to the subject of experience. I could go on about other levels. I could talk about networks and their integrity breaking down under drug. I could talk about how networks um, that ordinarily in a healthy adult human brain are especially um, segregated from each other, sufficiently separate and distinct from each other to do distinct functions, how that separateness breaks down under drug. And so if you zoom right out, you see a global system that's more integrated at the global level, even though at the level of a network, it's less integrated. Individual networks break down, but the whole of the brain is more communicative across modules, across systems. That's something we see under drug. And also recently, we've seen that after drug therapy, psychedelic therapy, psilocybin therapy, more specifically, in depression, we've seen it one day after and also three weeks after the the last uh, dosing session, this decrease in modularity or an increase in global brain integrity, more communication going on across the brain. So these different levels, you know, we've gone from molecule to protein to single cells sensitized to a population of neurons, thousands of them becoming dysregulated to networks breaking down and in the global system, um, more crosstalk across systems, yeah, or globally more integrated quality of communication. And that's probably where I'd stop it, other than to say that these things that happen, especially at the more macroscopic level that we can see with brain imaging, does map quite nicely to subjective experience. So we don't know what we don't know, but we're we're picking up these things. You know, there's um, thankfully there are group collaborations going on now, sharing psychedelic brain imaging data across teams. There's been there always is kind of debate in the field: what's real, what's not, what's noise, what's signal. But I think we're close now to establishing some important principles, and some of those that I've described, um, I I do feel quite confident will come through as as important principles. Excellent. And just following up on that inquiry regarding the default mode network, I am working to understand a little bit better about, is it, it an inhibition of that um, network of connectivity? Uh, is it an activation? Is the jury still out? And in, in reading one study um, published under the Johns Hopkins University, there was work done with octopuses that were under the influence of MDMA and octopuses lack a default mode network. So could there be something else at play here? Well, you know, the default mode network is an interesting system. Um, it's one of, uh, you know, series of uh, like basic um, systems in the brain or networks. We call them canonical brain networks. They're almost like the sort of basic alphabet of brain networks. You have one for vision, not just one, but let's say one main one for vision, one for hearing, one for moving your body, the motor system. And then you've got more high level networks, uh, ones for goal directed cognition, ones for sort of arousal or salience. And you have the default mode network. And the default mode network has captured people's imagination since it was first kind of discovered, you could say, in, in 2001, first sort of, you know, pivotal paper on it by Marcus Rakel, because it's a, it's mysterious, you know, and people have called it, you know, the, the brain's dark energy and, and this kind of thing. Um, you know, what is it? What is it that there's this system that is sort of basally highly active, Um churning away in the background hence the default mode network um yeah especially active um just by a small grade but especially active when we're sort of freewheeling in our thinking daydreaming or self-reflecting or you know imagining the future or our past but those kind of styles of cognition are kind of daydreamy and mind wandering but in contrast to when you focus on something specific, like a mathematical problem or something analytical, and you engage your mind, maybe on something in the external world, then you'll get a small dip in default mode network activity. It's still very active and gets a lot of blood flow, eats up a lot of glucose, um, but it does dip in its activity. And, and so that's partly why people inferred, oh, well, if it dips when you engage in stuff, 
you know, and then you disengage and it's up a bit, then maybe that's your default mode. It's interesting for other reasons. It's one of the, the aspects of cortex that's massively expanded in our species, uh, not exclusively, but, but one of them. Um, there's a various various bits of evidence that kinds of kind of position the default mode network at the top of a functional hierarchy in the brain, has more dense connectivity across the brain than any other uh, regions, uh, the core nodes of this system. And it is the case that under psychedelics, we showed this first in 2012 in our psilocybin fMRI work, um, PNAS paper, neural correlates of the psychedelic experience, that the default mode network decreases in its internal integrity or within system connectivity that goes down. Uh, we also saw a dip in blood flow. Um, I just I'm a little cautious these days about making strong inferences on changes in blood flow in the brain and how they map to activity because blood flow it's not a one to one mapping. Blood flow doesn't equal electrical activity, and sometimes you might have a change in the vasculature that might not necessarily map one to one in the change in the electrical activity, which is the core function. Uh, of, of computation in the brain. So I wouldn't say, I wouldn't commit to saying that psychedelics shut off the default mode network or decrease its activity. I, I think that's the wrong terminology. Uh, instead, I would look to the, um, the, in a sense, the regularity of activity in, in that system. And also the, yeah, you could, you could look at the integrity of that system, like the nodes within the system, the bits that make up the network, how strongly the, the activity in the different regions spatially separated um, go up and down in synchrony, you know, because if they go up and down in synchrony really strongly and reliably, then you have a highly integrous system. What you see under psychedelics is that they go out of sync, you know, and so that's the system decreasing in integrity or disintegrating, if you want. The default mode network does that under psychedelics. That happens to the default mode network under psychedelics, but it happens to other networks too. And I would say these days, I would um, advise maybe a little less default mode network centricity in our thinking of the action of psychedelics. I still think it's important, um, maybe centrally important, but not exclusively important. Uh, and I would also say it would be useful, I think, to move on from thinking of it shutting off under psychedelics or decreasing in activity and, and more thinking of it as becoming dysregulated and disintegrated under psychedelics. But again, not exclusively so. Yeah, that is helpful. Thank you for that. Yeah. I'm looking here now at this scientific report that is published in Nature um, that you co-authored on the co-use of MDMA with psilocybin, LSD, and how that combination may buffer against challenging experiences and enhancing positive experiences. Uh, this terminology I've seen referred to as candy flipping or hippie flipping, but this new realm of combining different psychedelic therapeutics, uh, I'm hopeful that you can speak a little bit more about what this paper demonstrated and where you see these combinations uh, having utility moving forward. Yeah, well, it's new in the above ground sense, but it's kind of old news in, in the underground sense because underground therapists have been combining substances for a good while. And a classic one is to combine, uh, say, psilocybin or a classic psychedelic with MDMA. And uh, you know, people differ on what comes first and when to introduce what first. If, if there's actually this would be an interesting study, we could put this to a survey. Maybe I'll do that. <laughs> so, podcast, we could ask people, you know, of those who've candy flipped or have done it, this might be more interesting, done it for therapeutic intentions or with therapeutic intentions. Did they go MDMA first, then classic, or psych, uh, classic first, then MDMA? I, I'm going to guess it's probably more often MDMA first, reducing anxiety, and then the classic comes in with less anxiety and more kind of comfort in oneself and and environment uh, the kind of positive effect um, as in emotion uh, that MDMA more reliably promotes than um, 
than classics. So in this paper, which is uh, drawing from um, subjective reports uh, in the wild rather than giving the drugs ourselves. So that's a limitation in terms of it's not a controlled study where we knew what the dose was. We were super confident that it was the drug that we think it is. Um, but it can also be an advantage because it has ecological validity, meaning it's a reflection of what actually happens in the real world. Anyway, there's been a bit of debate about this because there was a control study that showed that the combo didn't really change things like MDMA plus LSD. This is Matthias Lichty, um, I think, wasn't sufficiently different on the subjective rating scales that were issued to people from LSD alone. Like it seemed as though the classic dominated the picture. But since that, people have critiqued this saying, well, yeah, yeah it's one of the limitations of control studies is there's so, these constraints that lock in, that sort of limit otherwise interesting, you know, variability on things. So the doses are set. It may have been that the LSD dose kind of eclipsed any MDMA effect and that dominated the picture. It may well be that our subjects of rating scales aren't good enough. I tend to think that that is the case. And we're going to see over the next few years a significant improvement on how we index the phenomenology or subjective nature of the psychedelic experience and psychedelic-like experiences. So, you know, in this paper, it, it sort of shifted the debate a bit. You know, we had that negative finding with the control study, and here you've got something hinting at a, at a, in a sense, positive result, or actually the combo does change the quality of the experience is sufficiently different from, say, just a classic psychedelic experience alone. And the main finding, as I recall, um, was that it, in a sense, the MDMA took some of the unpleasant, potentially unpleasant, distressing qualities of a classic psychedelic experience away, the anxiety, the fear, sometimes terror. Um, you know, that was less with MDMA on board. And, you know, in a sense, choose your poison <laughs> but like you know there's different schools of thought on what's needed what's what's going to have the best benefit to harm ratio with the psychedelic therapy you know a question like do you need the challenge like a hero's journey is there something about the ordeal that is formative in some way that was worth it was worth it it was worth the ordeal and i got more in terms of sustained change, um, having gone through that ordeal than if I'd kind of taken the edge off with MDMA or any other particular compound. So the jury's out on that. Um, but, you know, we sh I don't think we should be too purist on this one because um, it can start to feel a little sadistic, like you have to suffer to grow. Uh, and... Um, and I, that could be a little heavy handed. And, and if underground therapists through their own kind of trial and error, sure, it's not lockdown science as sort of um, disciplined as we would do in the lab, but it's still a broadly speaking, a kind of science trial and error, then maybe they've found something that, that could be useful going forward. So mm -hmm. this particular study, you know, sh shines a spotlight on that. I hear you. Um, shifting gears a bit, we've just witnessed Australia to become the first country to recognize psilocybin and MDMA as medicines prescribed by a licensed provider. Yet in the United States, psychedelics are still a schedule one illegal substances or only reserved for the research setting. So given these legal and societal challenges that must be overcome so that people can have access to potential therapeutic benefit. How do you see the future of psychedelic research and the potential integration into this Western society and healthcare system and society at large? Well, that's a billion dollar question, isn't it? It's uh, full of tension points, uh, but it seems to be coming, you know, it looks as though maps, uh, will get, well, I don't know, premature here, forward-looking statement. But uh, if the if things go as MAPS plan, Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, having invested so much into MDMA therapy, 
therapy for post-traumatic stress disorder, now on the cusp with two completed phase three trials, licensing trials, essentially, to submit the results to the FDA, the drug regulators in the US, to ask, can we have a license for this treatment, to offer it as, as a treatment for people with post-traumatic stress disorder? You know, fully above board, a legal um, treatment. And, and that is, uh, in a sense, on schedule if there aren't any sort of curveballs or surprises for a, a license in 2024. But, you know, that's uh, to be seen. But that's where the hope is, you know. So that's in the US. Uh, things are getting through like that um, somewhat surprising but interesting um, policy decision in Australia to allow clinicians to prescribe and deliver psychedelic therapy. Very progressive, jumping the gun in a sense on any other jurisdiction with the, with the possible exception of Oregon with 109. So legal psilocybin therapy there already rolling out, which is interesting. And then Colorado coming next. There are other ballot initiatives. There's uh, one in Massachusetts, which which is um, sort of takes inspiration from Oregon, then Colorado. So all the time, I think, iterating and maybe you could say making improvements. And then a really exciting one in California, Treat California Initiative, which would um, root uh, state funds to psychedelic research and, and roll out. Um, so uh, that's a, a very, very interesting uh, initiative. Um, but I think these structured systems, rather than just a, an open legalization, is, is the right way to do it. I think a stepwise approach is best. We should learn from uh, events of the past. Um, it, it's easy, I think, for public opinion to shift. Uh, and so adverse events do happen, sometimes tragic, serious adverse events happen. People do injure themselves, sometimes even fatally, and take their lives. Uh, you know, these they're very, very rare, but they can happen, and they seem to happen more, more often in cases of sort of cases that you wouldn't see in a regulated system, in my mind, with, say, psilocybin therapy. That would be sufficient screening as the first kind of filter against this. And we're learning all the time, you know, where there might be elevated risk. Uh, there will be a, an age threshold and there will be really important the context. Of course, set and setting is a classic, you know, uh, sort of cornerstone of, of psychedelic therapy that the context in which you take the drug is essentially important. So, you know, when things have gone horribly wrong, tragically wrong, it's often when things are happening that don't meet the standards that we would have in a regulated system. So although I probably consider myself a, a libertarian, there are, are limits to that. And uh, I think in this case, mm -hmm. some well thought through infrastructure and regulation is, is needed. But, but I think that's coming through. And like I said, improving probably improving all the time with the different policies that are coming in. So it's uh, positive times. Yeah. And, and so you have these sort of ballot initiatives that are different to, you know, the classic drug development development model, which is the, the FDA is the drug regulator saying, you know, in this federal jurisdiction and beyond, um, this can be a medicine. This is now recognized by us as medicine regulators as a medicine that can be prescribed legally you know in a large jurisdiction nationally federally and so that's on on the cards so it seems with mdma therapy for ptsd it's probably let's see now three or four years downstream maybe four with psilocybin therapy for depression um, but that's the direction of travel in a major infrastructure level change coming within easily within the next decade with psychedelics and so it's exciting it's scary uncertain yeah yeah i i agree it is it is exciting and a stepwise process to deregulation may be uh may be best uh, there's another initiative that i would be remiss if i didn't acknowledge and that is one that has taken to effect in the state of Kentucky. 
they've announced plans to put forward $42 million towards Ibogaine research for addiction healing with the backdrop of the opioid crisis. And from my reading, it looks like uh, Ibogaine can also help with other entities in the mental health realm, uh, including PTSD. Um, and there's some studies that have looked at uh, 5-MeO-DMT, another psychedelic. Now, your body of work has done a, a lot of looking at psilocybin and, and, and LSD, but being an expert in the, in the world of psychedelics, I am curious what your perspective is and your thoughts are on Ibogaine and other psychedelics like 5-MeO-DMT. Well, they're certainly of interest. Uh, while I don't have any active studies with Ibogaine, I'm indirectly uh, involved in a study with 5-MeO at Imperial with my former colleagues there. It's going to be a brain imaging study, high density EG and, and, uh, and 5-MeO in collaboration with, with Beckley SciTech. So that's exciting. You know, as a consciousness researcher, I sort of wear two hats. Um, being a consciousness researcher, using psychedelics as tools to understand the mind and the brain, and then this clinical research, looking at psychedelic therapy as, a, as an intervention. So the 5-MEO certainly, you know, appeals to both uh, interests. Um, yeah, in terms of the consciousness research, the quality of the altered state of consciousness with 5-MEO is, uh, is, is fascinating, um, being seemingly quite distinct from other classic psychedelics um, and wanting, you know, to capture what that difference is, uh, the difference that makes a difference that can pass between, say, DMT and 5-MeO. It's a really interesting question. Why is 5-MeO more reliably a sort of ego dissolution, oneness, unitive experience? Um, and then the DMT experience is more visual and elaborate, rich, um, and less of, of a loading on that ego dissolution uh, factor. Uh, that's a very interesting question. Whether or not we'll be able to answer that with high density EG, I'm not sure. Maybe fMRI is needed for that. fMRI, and, and let's not neglect the subjective domain because it's just as important. And I, th I think we need to improve our ways of sampling the subjective domain. Um, and there's a few ways we could do that. Um, and then, yeah, therapeutically, uh, you know, I, I hear and see the signal albeit secondhand, coming out of the Ibogaine research, um, like the naturalistic research that's been done by the likes of Nolan Williams with uh, veterans uh, having Ibogaine experiences, uh, um, treating, in a sense, self-treating, uh, albeit in a ceremonial context, but treating usually PTSD. Often there's some, some blast trauma as well or some... Um, you know, brain injury, trauma, and a lot of comorbidities come with that that setup. But the findings that are coming from Nolan and his lab are really exciting. There, um, yeah. So you know, you can't you can't help but be impressed, and and um, and then knowing the history and the literature around ad treating addiction. So I think there's huge potential there. Again, I began is. Uh, quite different from the classic psychedelics there's some overlap things like the emergence of unconscious material into consciousness does seem to be there with with ibogaine and and the idea this was an early idea that i was very much sold on and actually this is almost sort of central it was central to the idea i took to david nutt uh, which was that the psychedelic state might be a hybrid dream state hybrid waking dream um, meaning that the physiology, the neurophysiology of rapid eye movement sleep, when we have most reliably our dreams, um, we have dreams and vivid, emotionally laden dreams, much more reliable and robust within rapid eye movement sleep. So if that's the state uh, underlying the dream experience, then maybe we would see its signatures in the waking state, albeit a hybrid waking state under a psychedelic using 
you know, brain imaging technologies. We haven't quite hit the nail on, on the head with that one, hints at it, but uh, maybe that's coming downstream. And I know others share the intuition. But I think with Ibogaine, people have described it as, I don't quite know how you pronounce it, but like an oneric or, on, yeah, it's like O-N-E-I-R-I-C, I think. So, and that means like dream promoting, a dream promoting compound. And, you know, the long half-life as well, meaning the long duration of the subjective experience with Ibogaine is different. So very, very fascinating, both compounds in terms of tools to probe the mind and brain. For consciousness research purposes and uh, therapeutic purposes. Yeah, very, very interesting compounds. I'm happy to hear you invoke Nolan Williams's name. Uh, he is of Stanford fame and a friend of the podcast. So Ooh. I'm sure he'll be pleased to, to listen to this later. Um, there's something that you said that uh, inspired a, a follow-up inquiry as we recognize that most of the 5-MeO-DMT in its natural state comes from the Sonoran Desert Toad. Ibogaine, of course, comes from uh, a root bark that grows in uh, Gabon, Africa. MDA is a little bit different as it's a synthetic compound. Psilocybin, of course, has both the uh, natural state and a synthetic uh, variant. As someone who studies these in a, in a field of both the clinical and research setting to better understand consciousness, a very, very hot topic that came up at the most recent psychedelic science conference in Denver was that of invoking and involving indigenous cultures who have used these compounds for thousands of years. And uh, there's a little bit of trepidation about commodification, as we've seen uh, with the cacao plant and um, with uh, different sort of other plant, plant medicines uh, that have uh, once entered the Western system uh, may be abused. Uh, so I'm just curious, you know, as, as scientists, what we can do to recognize that paradigm uh, and, and involve the indigenous cultures and, and their take uh, because there is this ceremonial context that isn't always easily replicated uh, in a clinical setting. Uh, you know, the, the, an ayahuasca ceremony under the guidance of a shaman is very different than, you know, a Ben Sessa type who's doing work in a clinical lab to guide a PTSD journey. How, how do you sort of digest all of that uh, information with the backdrop of uh, the history of, of indigenous cultures? and the potential risk of commodification of these uh, powerful plant medicines. Gosh, well, there's, there's a lot there. It's, it's, it's a hot one, another one full of uh, tension points. In a sense, it's a political one. So a lot could be said on it. I guess there's this um, situation where you have a certain culture in the West um, with a certain model, the medical model, trying to do something to treat serious mental illness that I would argue isn't, isn't blind to what's happened in terms of the, the history. And has it been sort of stolen? It's been, has inspiration's been taken. Um, I guess we have a capitalist model in the West that is, going to commodify and commercialize that could feel unfair uh, to cultures that have been using this and haven't pursued, you know, haven't been driven by those goals and intentions of profit making and, you know, monopolizing. So I hear that that's very much a political uh, tension and a culture clash, um, where in the indigenous cultures, they would be doing this with arguably more uh, with it well it's really not an argument <laughs> with purer intent just wanting to heal and and self growth and group growth and community growth and living in in harmony with one's environment um rather than you know extracting um in a way that uh, the long view says is damaging to environment and to community and to individual so i i hear all that i know there've been uh, stories and incidences from the past in terms of exploitation. I'm thinking of Maria Sabina and what came of her when she introduced 
you know, in a, in a sense, you know, through circumstance, I suppose, introduced the West to magic mushrooms and uh, and then was, you know, sort of punished in a sense by the community around her for how that awareness created a kind of drug tourism that um, negatively impacted their way of life. And then she was really um, sort of outcast because of that and really tragic uh story there now it's a tricky it's a tricky one isn't it because you don't want the west not to turn on to this power and this knowledge particularly when there is significant psychological suffering and poor tools to deal with it so how can it be done in a way that stays true to good intention and i think that's a question that yeah, many of us are thinking about. I don't really have good answers. I see some companies that are interesting. Journey Collab is one that uh, have a, a system for reciprocity and giving back, which is very interesting. Of the various companies that I've rubbed shoulders with along the way, they're one of my favorite, I would say, because of their uh, principles. Um, and it's a, it's a very interesting one, sort of stepping out of falling into a, a political pot <laughs> uh, and sort of seeing the politics as a thing of interest, uh, sort of sociological perspective. I do find this tension uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, then, yeah, it's, it's complicated because you have things like MDMA, MDMA synthesized, it's a thing, you know, first synthesized by Merck in the 20s, I think, 1920s. <laughs> Um, and then, you know, picked up and, of course, Shulgin. So it's, it, not, it doesn't have that history in the same way. But then, you know, you have classic problems around like peyote cacti that are over harvested and so on. So there are specifics here. And, and I think what often happens in politics is people lose the ability to see nuance as they fall into these camps. They fall into these political pots. Which is something very much I, I, I want to avoid. I, I don't, whether it's an idealism or I'm just shirking responsibility, I, I really try and stay out of politics with my science. But uh, people critique that and say it's it's impossible. But, yeah. I really appreciate your, your take. I think that was really uh, an astute reply uh, and a comprehensive one. And with that, I have one more line of questioning and this is um, a personal pursuit, a personal interest. As a neurologist, I'm very intrigued and inspired by the potential for psychedelics to serve a role beyond the mental health space, beyond depression, anxiety, and addiction. And it looks like there's some novel studies looking at the role for psilocybin to address neurodegenerative diseases like dementia, and Parkinson's, maybe even traumatic brain injury and stroke. Now with these, is there a, a different mechanism of action at play? Uh, is, this, is this neuroplasticity at work? Um, are you hopeful about psychedelics for having a role in the neurological realm? And how can it be that a group of restricted therapeutics can have benefits for so many potential different uh, indications and diagnoses? Well, quite. Uh, I mean, on that, um, I would say there is a there is a model. I've I've got a model o o in terms of how psychedelics could treat um, psychiatric disorder. I called it the um, canalization model of psychopathology, which tries to outline the problem and then says psychedelic therapy is a very effective solution for that given problem. Short story, the problem being a uh, entrenchment of certain ways of thinking and behaving that become over-practiced on a cerebral level through downward causation, if you want. You do it to yourself almost. Um, uh, and it uh, entrenches the problem. It entrenches the problem. So something's learnt that is often learnt for defensive reasons, but then becomes the core of the problem. It served you, but is now not serving you or it serves you to a point and, and maybe 
to undo it will be hard, will be an ordeal, will be struggle, but there'll be growth from it. The neurological disorders, uh, there's overlap, but in the Venn diagram space, I would say in psychopathology, you have a lot of strong overlap. I, I think there's a strong principle component that I have stuck my neck out and have said, look up canalization as a as evolutionary theory construct, but relevant computationally, mechanistically, the overweighting of stuff that we do with our minds and our behavior, that's where the problem lies. Um, so in the space of neurology, you have something that is sort of, there's some overlap. You'll have depression and Alzheimer's and, you know, anxiety and but there's some degree of distinction as well. And I would probably caution a little bit against seeing psychedelics as a panacea across the board for health. Uh, I'm not convinced that it's quite so compelling for neurological disorders like dementia and Parkinson's. I really hope I'm wrong, of course, and I hope that there's signal there. But I would say, of course, I'm hopeful, um, but cautiously so. And it doesn't feel quite as compelling. Having said that, I have seen some preliminary evidence. In fact, we've got some of anatomical brain changes with psychedelics that are in a positive direction. From Nolan, I've, I've seen his data on um, increases in gray matter density with Ibogaine after Ibogaine. And in our data at Imperial, UCSF now, we've seen changes in the white matter tracks, the cabling of the brain that broadly speaking, are in a positive direction. They're in the opposite direction to what you see in an aging brain and in pathologies of, of aging like neurodegenerative disorders. So I actually got a paper that's going into review right now. Um, I worked on with a colleague, some colleagues at Imperial mostly, uh, around this notion of the inner healer, which is this fascinating term that you hear, which is this idea that's, that's either projection and a made up thing, kind of mythology that psychedelics have an intrinsically healing action or it's it's a real thing and there is something going on in terms of brain dynamics maybe even structure that are regenerative in a sense um, and so time will tell on that it's one of the most fascinating mysteries in this space i think is you know what is the the healing actual sort of biological intrinsic healing action of these compounds do they have any at all or do we project that onto them because of the quality of the experience and perhaps how we frame the context and our intentions around the experience as well yeah that is all fascinating and as we wrap up this uh, really uh, interesting interview i want to uh, extend the invitation for you to share what you're most excited to work on uh, through the end of this year and what you anticipate studying uh, next year. And then if anybody wants to learn more about your work, where they can go. Yeah, cool. Well, I'm working on a new website. It's, it's not done yet, but it will be carhartharrislab.com. So I'm just launching, properly launching my lab at UCSF. Taking me a little while to get going on that front, but it's happening now and that's exciting. Um, so in time, I, I'd say it's premature now, but check out carhartharrislab.com, which is where I'll have a lot of content, um, you know, videos and articles and scientific publications and collaborations. I'm launching something alongside this called the Psychedelic Science Collaborative, which is uh, more a hierarchical, um, horizontal sort of structure. It's just scientists collaborating across labs, across centers, sharing data, sharing ideas. It's very much an ideal, but it's an ideal consistent with principles of open science, you know, for the sake of collective understanding. That's the sort of value, value statement. Yeah. And um, so there'll be that. Uh, in terms of studies, there's so much, but one that's just starting now is this deep dive into psychedelic substates, you know, and very, very briefly to date, most of the work without exception, maybe one or two slight exceptions, but not really, have, have done mappings between one chunk of brain data and one bank of subjective ratings. So one to one mapping and called it, you know, guilty here the neurocorrelates of the psychedelic state. And then, you know, sophisticated people have come along in the know and said, 
what's the psychedelic state? You know, it's not one thing, you know, what, where, where's the nuance here? And so what we're doing in this new study is to use experience sampling to check in more regularly to within a single subject collect over 200 mappings between experience and brain, chunks of data that are not too small, decent chunks of data. We can look at the quality of brain activity, look at things like network properties, and then map it to subjective experience across time. And that, I think that's going to be a major advance. And it's the kind of approach that can allow for more data-driven questions to be asked uh, in line with machine learning, having bigger data in order to find implicit patterns that otherwise you miss um, if you just go sort of top down. So that's really exciting. I think that's going to move the needle on our understanding of how these drugs work in the brain acutely. And there's a bunch of stuff, but that's kind of the closest jump off right now. Excellent. Well, I will be following along closely uh, with eager enthusiasm. I want to extend gratitude to you, Professor Robin Carhart Harris, for your, your time and um, your excitement for this interview. I really appreciate it. And I wanna thank Psychedelics Anonymous for serving as the sponsor for this platform to allow us the space to have the conversation. Very much appreciated. Thank you, Burton, and thanks everyone. This episode is brought to you by ForestBars.com, natural supplements for human enhancement. Forest produces full-spectrum, bioactive, mushroom-infused chocolate with powerful benefits, sustainably sourced and served. Receive 10% off your first order with code 0HOUR10.